The Pretentious Young Ladies by Moliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Pretentious Young Ladies A Comedy in One Act. Dramatis Personae. Lagrange, read by Gavin Hurlbut. Du Croisset, read by John Trevithick. Repulsed Lovers. Georges Bou, read by Nathaniel W. C. Higgins. A Good Citizen. The Marquis de Masqueril, recorded by Chuck Williamson. Valet to Lagrange. The Vicomte Jodelet, read by Tricia G. Valet to Du Grossi. Alamanzor, read by Todd. Footman to the Pretentious Ladies. Chairman One, read by Todd. Chairman Two, read by Todd. Musician, read by Todd. Madelon, read by Christine G. Daughter to Gorgibus. Catos, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Niece to Gorgibus, the pretentious young ladies. Marot, recorded by Christine Nenza. May to the pretentious young ladies. Lucille, read by Lucy Perry and Silamene, two female neighbors. Narration by Todd. Scene, Gorgibus House, Paris. Scene one. Mr. Lagrange. What? Look at me for a moment without laughing. Well? What do you say of our visit? Are you quite pleased with it? Do you think either of us has any reason to be so? Not at all, to say the truth. As for me, I must acknowledge I was quite shocked at it. Pray now, did ever anybody see a couple country wenches giving themselves more ridiculous airs, or two men treated with more contempt than we were? They could hardly make up their mind to order chairs for us. I never saw such whispering as there was between them, such yawning, such rubbing of the eyes, and asking so often what o'clock it was. Did they answer anything else but yes or no to what we said to them? In short, do you not agree with me that if we had been the meanest persons in the world, we could not have been treated worse? You seem to take it greatly to heart. No doubt I do, so much so that I am resolved to be revenged on them for their impertinence. I know well enough why they despise us. Affectation has not alone infected Paris, but it has also spread into the country, and our ridiculous damsels have sucked in their share of it. In a word, they are a strange medley of coquetry and affectation. I plainly see what kind of persons will be well received by them. If you will take my advice, we will play them such a trick as shall show them their folly, and teach them to distinguish a little better the people they have to deal with. How can you do this? I have a certain valet named Mascaril, who in the opinion of many people passes for a kind of wit, for nothing nowadays is easier than to acquire such a reputation. He is an extraordinary fellow, who has taken it into his head to ape a person of equality. He usually prides himself on his gallantry and his poetry, and despises so much the other servants he calls them brutes. Well, what do you mean to do with him? What do I mean to do with him? He must... But first let us be gone. Scene 2 Well, gentlemen, you have seen my niece and my daughter. How are matters going on? What is the result of your visit? They will tell you this better than we can. All we say is that we thank you for the favor you've done us, and remain your most humble servants. Your most humble servants. Alone? Hoity-toity, methinks they go away dissatisfied. What can be the meaning of this? I must find it out. Within there. Scene 3 Did you call, sir? Where are your mistresses? In their room. What are they doing there? Making lip salve. There is no end of their salves. Bid them come down. Alone? These hussies with their salves have, I think, a mind to ruin me. Everywhere in the house I see nothing but whites of eggs, lack virginal, and a thousand other fooleries I am not acquainted with. Since we have been here, they have employed the lard of a dozen hogs at least, and four servants might live every day on the sheep's trotters they use. Scene 4. Truly there is great need to spend so much money to grease your faces. Pray tell me, what have you done to those gentlemen that I saw them go away with so much coldness? 
Did I not order you to receive them as persons whom I intended for your husbands? Dear father, what consideration do you wish us to entertain for the irregular behaviour of these people? How can a woman of ever so little understanding, uncle, reconcile herself to such individuals? What fault have you to find with them? This is fine gallantry indeed. Would you believe it? They began with proposing marriage to us. What would you have them begin with? With a proposal to keep you as mistresses? Is not their proposal a compliment to both of you, as well as to me? Can anything be more polite than this? And do they not prove the honesty of their intentions by wishing to enter these holy bonds? Oh, father, nothing can be more vulgar than what you have just said. I am ashamed to hear you talk in such a manner. You should take some lessons in the elegant way of looking at things. I care neither for elegant ways nor songs. I tell you marriage is a holy and sacred affair. To begin with, that is to act like honest people. Good heavens! If everybody was like you, a love story would soon be over. What a fine thing it would have been if Cyrus had immediately espoused Mandane, and if Arachne had been married all at once to Clélière. What is she jabbering about? Here is my cousin, father, who will tell as well as I that matrimony ought never to happen till after other adventures. A lover, to be agreeable, must understand how to utter fine sentiments, to breed soft, tender, and passionate vows. His courtship must be according to the rules. In the first place, he should behold the fair one, of whom he becomes enamoured, either at a place of worship, or when out walking, or at some public ceremony, or else he should be introduced to her by a relative or a friend, as if by chance, and when he leaves her he should appear in a pensive and melancholy mood. For some time he should conceal his passion from the object of his love, but pay her several visits, in every one of which he ought to introduce some gallant subject to exercise the wits of all the company. When the day comes to make his declarations, which generally should be contrived in some shady garden walk while the company is at a distance, it should be quickly followed by anger, which is shown by our blushing, and which, for a while, banishes the lover from our presence. He finds afterwards means to pacify us, to accustom us gradually to hear him depict his passion, and to draw from us that confession which causes us so much pain. After that come the adventures, the rivals who thwart mutual inclination, the persecution of fathers, the jealousies arising without any foundation, complaints, despair, running away with, and its consequences. Thus things are carried on in a fashionable life, and veritable gallantry cannot dispense with these forms. But to come out point-blank with a proposal of marriage, to make no love but with a marriage contract, and begin a novel at the wrong end? Once more, father, nothing can be more tradesmanlike, and the mere thought of it makes me sick at heart. What deuced nonsense is all this? That is high-flown language with a vengeance. Indeed, uncle, my cousin hits the nail on the head. How can we receive kindly those who were so awkward in gallantry? I could lay a wager they have not even seen a map of the country of tenderness, and that love-letters, trifling attentions, polite epistles, and sprightly verses are regions to them unknown. Do you not see that the whole person shows it, and that their external appearance is not such as to give at first sight a good opinion of them. To come and pay a visit to the object of their love, with a leg without any ornaments, a hat without any feathers, a head with its locks not artistically arranged, and a coat that suffers from a paucity of ribbons. Heavens, what lovers are these! What stinginess in dress! What barrenness of conversation! It is not to be allowed, it is not to be born. I also observed that their ruffs were not made by the fashionable milliner, and that their breeches were not big enough by more than half a foot. I think they are both mad, nor can I understand anything of this gibberish. Cathos, and you, Madelon. Pray, father, do not use those strange names, and call us by some other. What do you mean by those strange names? Are they not the names your godfathers and godmothers gave you? Good heavens! How vulgar you are! 
I confess I wonder you could possibly be the father of such an intelligent girl as I am. Did ever anybody in genteel style talk of Cathos or of Madelon? And must you not admit that either of these names would be sufficient to disgrace the finest novel in the world? It is true, uncle. An ear rather delicate suffers extremely at hearing these words pronounced, and the name of Polixena, which my cousin has chosen, and that of Amintha, which I took, possess a charm which you must needs acknowledge. Hearken! One word will suffice. I do not allow you to take any other names than those that were given you by your godfathers and godmothers. And as for those gentlemen we are speaking about, I know their families and fortunes, and am determined they shall be your husbands. I am tired of having you upon my hands. Looking after a couple of girls is rather too weighty for a charge for a man of my years. As for me, uncle, all I can say is that I think marriage a very shocking business. How can one endure the thought of lying by the side of a man who is really naked? Give us leave to take breath for a short time among the fashionable whirl of Paris, where we are but just arrived. Allow us to prepare at our leisure the groundwork of our novel, and do not hurry on the conclusion too abruptly. Aside. I cannot doubt it any longer. They are completely mad. Aloud. Once more I tell you, I understand nothing of all this gibberish. I will be master, and to cut short all kinds of arguments, either you shall both be married shortly, or, upon my word, you shall be nuns. That I swear. Scene 6 Good heavens, my dear! How deeply is your father still immersed in material things! How dense is his understanding! And what gloom overcasts his soul! What can I do, my dear? I am ashamed of him. I can hardly persuade myself I am indeed his daughter. I believe that an accident, some time or other, will discover me to be more of an illustrious descent. I believe it. Really, it is very likely. As for me, when I consider myself— Scene 7 Here is a footman asks if you are at home, and says his master is coming to see you. Learn, you dunce, to express yourself a little less vulgarly. Say— here is a necessary evil, inquiring if it is commodious for you to become visible. I do not understand Latin, and have not learned philosophy out of Cyrus, as you have done. Impertinent creature! How can this be borne? And who is this footman's master? He told me it was the Marquis de Mascaril. Ah, my dear! A Marquise! A Marquise! Well, go and tell him we are visible. This is certainly some wit who has heard of us. Undoubtedly, my dear. We had better receive him here in this parlour than in our room. Let us at least arrange our hair a little and maintain our reputation. Come in quickly and reach us to the Consular of the Graces. Oh, upon my word, I do not know what sort of a beast that is. You must speak like a Christian if you would have me know your meaning. Bring us the looking-glass, you blockhead and take care not to contaminate its brightness by the communication of your image. Scene 8 Stop, Chairman, stop! Easy does it, easy, easy! Oh, I think these boobies intend to break me to pieces by bumping me against the walls and the pavement. Why, Mary, because the gate is narrow, and you would make us bring you in here. To be sure, you rascals! Would you have me expose the fullness of my plumes to the inclemency of the rainy season, and let the mud receive the impression of my shoes? Oh, be gone! Take away your chair! Then please to pay us, sir! What? Sir, please to give us our money, I say! Giving him a box on the ear. What scoundrel to ask money from a person of my rank! Is this the way poor people are to be paid? Will your rank get us a dinner? <laughs> I shall teach you to keep your right place. Those low fellows dare to make fun of me. Taking up one of the poles of his chair. Come, pay us quickly. What? I mean to have my money at once. That is a sensible fellow. Make haste, then. Aye, you speak properly. 
but the other is a scoundrel who does not know what he says there are you satisfied no i am not satisfied you box my friend's ears and holding up his pole gently there is something for the box on the ear people may get anything from me when they go about it in the right way go now but come and fetch me by and by to carry me to the louvre to the petit cochet scene nine sir my mistresses will come immediately let them not hurry themselves i am very comfortable here and can wait here they come scene ten after having bowed to them ladies you no doubt will be surprised at the boldness of my visit but your reputation has drawn this disagreeable affair upon you merit has for me such potent charms that i run everywhere after it if you pursue merit you should not come to us if you find merit amongst us you must have brought it hither yourself i protest against these words when fame mentioned your deserts it spoke the truth and you are going to make peak the peak and capa all the gallants from paris your complaisance goes a little too far in the liberality of its praises and my cousin and i must take care not to give too much credit to your sweet adulation my dear we should call for chairs almansor madam Convey to us hither, instantly, the conveniences of conversation. Exit Alonzor. But am I safe here? What is it you fear? Some larceny of my heart, some massacre of liberty. I behold here a pair of eyes that seem to be very naughty boys, that insult liberty and use a heart most barbarously why the deuce do they put themselves on their guard in order to kill any one who comes near them upon my word i mistrust them i shall either scamper away or expect very good security that they do me no mischief my dear what a charming facetiousness he has i see indeed he is an amilcar fear nothing our eyes have no wicked designs and your heart may rest in peace fully assured of their innocence but pray sir be not inexorable to the easy chair which for this last quarter of an hour has held out its arms towards you yield to its desire of embracing you after having combed himself and adjusted the rolls of his stockings well ladies and what do you think of paris alas what can we think of it it would be the very antipodes of reason not to confess that Paris is the grand cabinet of marvels, the centre of good taste, wit, and gallantry. As for me, I maintain that, out of Paris, there is no salvation for the polite world. Most assuredly. Paris is somewhat muddy, but we have sedan chairs. To be sure, a sedan chair is a wonderful protection against the insults of mud and bad weather i am sure you receive many visits what great wit belongs to your company alas we are not yet known but we are in the way of being so for a lady of our acquaintance has promised us to bring all the gentlemen who have written for the miscellaneous of select poetry and certain others whom we have been told are likewise the sovereign arbiters of all that is handsome i can manage this for you better than any one they all visit me and i may say that i never rise without having half a dozen wits at my levy good heavens you will place us under the greatest obligation if you will do us the kindness for in short we must make the acquaintance of all those gentlemen if we wish to belong to the fashion they are the persons who can make or unmake a reputation at paris you know that there are some whose visits alone are sufficient to start a report that you are connoisseurs, though there should be no other reason for it. As for me, what I value particularly is, that by means of these ingenious visits we learn a hundred things which we are necessary to know, and which are the quintessence of wit. Through them we hear the scandal of the day, 
or whatever niceties are going on in prose or worse, we know, at the right time, that Mr. So-and-so has written the finest piece in the world on such a subject, that Mrs. So-and-so has adapted words to such a tune, that a certain gentleman has written a madrigal upon a favour shown to him, another stances upon a fair one who betrayed him. Mr. Such-a-one wrote a couplet of six lines yesterday evening to Miss Such-a-one, to which she returned him an answer this morning at eight o'clock. Such an author is engaged on such a subject. This writer is busy with the third volume of his novel. That one is putting his works to press. Those things procure your consideration in every society, and if people are ignorant of them, I would not give one pinch of snuff for all the wit they may have. Indeed, I think it the height of ridicule for any one who possesses the slightest claim to be called clever not to know even the smallest couplet that is made every day. As for me, I should be very much ashamed if any one should ask me my opinion about something new, and I had not seen it. It is really a shame not to know from the very first all that is going on. But do not give yourself any farther trouble. I will establish an academy of wits at your house, and I give you my word that not a single line of poetry shall be written in Paris but what you shall be able to say by heart before anybody else. As for me, such as you see me, I amuse myself in that way when I am in the humour, and you may find handed about in the fashionable assemblies of Paris two hundred songs, as many sonnets, four hundred epigrams, and more than a thousand madrigals, all made by me, without counting riddles and portraits. I must acknowledge that I dote upon portraits. I think there is nothing more gallant portraits are difficult and call for great wit you shall see some of mine that will not displease you as for me i am awfully fond of riddles they exercise the intelligence i have already written four of them this morning which i will give you to guess madrigals are pretty enough when they are neatly turned that is my special talent i am at present engaged in turning the whole roman history into madrigals goodness gracious that will certainly be super relatively fine i should like to have one copy at least if you think of publishing it i promise you each a copy bound in the handsomest manner it does not become a man of my rank to scribble but i do it only to serve the publishers who are always bothering me i fancy it must be a delightful thing to see oneself in print undoubtedly but by the by i must repeat to you some extempore verses i made yesterday at the house of a certain duchess an acquaintance of mine <laughs> i am deuced clever at extempore verses extempore verses are certainly the very touchstone of genius listen then we are all ears oh, oh, quite without heed was i as harmless you i chanced to spy slyly your eyes my heart surprise stop thief stop thief stop thief i cry good heavens this is carried to the utmost pitch of gallantry everything i do shows it is done by a gentleman there is nothing of the pedant of my effusions they are more than two thousand miles removed from that did you observe the beginning oh oh there is something original in that oh oh like a man who all of a sudden thinks about something oh oh taken by surprise as it were oh oh yes i think that oh oh admirable it seems a mere nothing good heavens how can you say so it is one of these things that are perfectly invaluable no doubt on it i would rather have written that oh oh than an epic poem egad you have good taste tolerably none of the worst i believe but do you not also admire quite without heed was i quite without heed was i that is i did not pay attention to anything a natural way of speaking 
quite without heed was i of no harm thinking uh, that is as i was going along innocently without malice like a poor sheep you i chanced to spy that is to say i amused myself with looking at you with observing you with contemplating you slyly your eyes what do you think of that word slyly is it not well chosen extremely so slyly stealthily just like a cat watching a mouse slyly nothing can be better my heart surprised that is carries it away from me robs me of it stop thief stop thief stop thief would you not think a man were shouting and running after a thief to catch him stop thief stop thief stop thief i must admit the turn is witty and sprightly i will sing you the tune i made to it have you learned music i not at all how can you make a tune then people of rank know everything without ever having learned anything his lordship is quite in the right my dear listen if you like the tune him, him, la, la. the inclemency of the season has greatly injured the delicacy of my voice but no matter it is in a free and easy way he sings oh oh quite without heed was i etc what a passion there breathes in this music it is enough to make one die away with delight there is something plaintive in it do you not think that the air perfectly well expresses the sentiment stop thief stop thief and then as if some one cried out very loud stop 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 thief then all at once like a person out of breath stop thief this is to understand the perfection of things the grand perfection the perfection of perfections i declare it is altogether a wonderful performance i am quite enchanced with the air and the words i never yet met with anything so excellent all that i do comes naturally to me it is without study nature has treated you like a very fond mother you are her darling child how do you pass away the time ladies with nothing at all until now we have lived in a terrible dearth of amusements i am at your service to attend you to the play one of those days if you will permit me indeed a new comedy is to be acted which i should be very glad we might see together there is no refusing you anything but i beg of you to applaud it well when we shall be there for i have promised to give a helping hand to the piece the author called upon me this very morning to beg me to do so it is the custom of authors to read their new plays to people of rank that they may induce us to approve of them and give them a reputation i leave you to imagine if when we say anything the pit dares contradict us as for me i am very punctual in these things and when i have made a promise to a poet i always cry out bravo before the candles are lighted do not say another word paris is an admirable place a hundred things happen every day which people in the country however clever they may be have no idea of since you have told us we shall consider it our duty to cry up lustily every word that is said i do not know whether i am deceived but you look as if you had written some play yourself eh uh, there may be something in what you say ah upon my word we must see it between ourselves i have written one which i intend to have brought out ay to what company do you mean to give it that is a very nice question indeed to the actors of the hotel de bourgogne they alone may bring these things into good repute the rest are ignorant creatures who recite their parts just as people speak in everyday life they do not understand to mouth the verses or to pause at a beautiful passage how can it be known where the fine lines are if an actor does not stop at them and thereby tell you to applaud heartily indeed that is one way of making an audience feel the beauties of any work things are only prized when they are well set off 
what do you think of my top-knot sword-knot and rosettes do you find them harmonize with my coat perfectly do you think the ribbon well chosen furiously well it is really pedrigian what do you say of my rolls they look very fashionable i may at least boast that they are a quarter of a yard wider than any that have been made i must own i never saw the elegance of dress carrier father please to fasten the reflection of your smelling faculty upon these gloves they smell awfully fine i never inhaled a more delicious perfume and this he gives them his powdered wig to smell it has a true quality odour it titillates the nerves of the upper region most deliciously you say nothing of my feathers how do you like them they are frightfully beautiful do you know that every single one of them cost me a louis d'or but it is in my hobby to have generally everything of the very best i assure you that you and i sympathize i am furiously particular in everything i wear i cannot endure even stockings unless they are bought at a fashionable shop crying out suddenly oh 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 gently dame ladies you use me very ill i have reason to complain of your behaviour it is not fair what is the matter with you what to at once against my heart to attack me thus right and left <laughs> this is contrary to the law of nations the combat is too unequal and i must cry out murder well he does say things in a peculiar way he is a consummate wit you are more afraid than hurt and your heart cries out before it is even wounded the devil it does it is wounded all over from head to foot scene eleven madam somebody asks to see you who the viscount de jodelet the viscount de jodelet yes sir do you know him he is my most intimate friend show him in immediately we have not seen each other for some time i am delighted to meet him here he comes scene twelve ah oh, viscount ah marquis embracing each other how glad i am to meet you how happy i am to see you here embrace me once more i pray you to Cathos. my dearest we begin to be known people of fashion find the way to our house ladies allow me to introduce this gentleman to you upon my word he deserves the honour of your acquaintance it is but just we should come and pay you what we owe your charms demand their lordly rights from all sorts of people you carry your civilities to the utmost confines of flattery this day ought to be marked in our diary as a red letter day to almanzor come boy must you always be told things over and over again do you not observe there must be an additional chair you must not be astonished to see the viscount thus he has but just recovered from an illness which as you perceive has made him so pale the consequence of continual attendance at court and the fatigues of war do you know ladies that in the viscount you behold one of the heroes of the age he is a very valiant man marquis you are not inferior to me we also know what you can do it is true we have seen one another at work when there was need for it and in places where it was hot looking at Cathos and Madelon. Aye, but not so hot as here. <laughs> we became acquainted in the army. The first time we saw each other he commanded a regiment of horse aboard the galleys of Malta. True, but for all that you were in the service before me. I remember that I was but a young officer when you commanded two thousand horses. War is a fine thing but upon my word the court does not properly reward men of merit like us that is the reason i intend to hang up my sword as for me i have a tremendous liking for gentlemen of the army i love them too but i like bravery seasoned with wit 
do you remember viscount our taking that half moon from the enemy at the siege of arras what do you mean by a half moon it was a complete full moon i believe you are right upon my word i ought to remember it very well i was wounded in the leg by a hand grenade of which i carry the marks pray feel it you can perceive what sort of a wound it was putting her hand into the place the scar is really large give me your hand for a moment and feel this there just at the back of my head do you feel it i i feel something a musket shot which i received the last campaign i served in unbuttoning his breast here is a wound which went quite through me at the attack of gravelines putting his hand upon the button of his breeches i am going to show you a tremendous wound there is no occasion for it we believe it without seeing it they are honours marks that show what a man is made of we have not the least doubt of the valour of you both viscount is your coach in waiting why we shall give these ladies an airing and offer them a collation we cannot go out to-day let us send for musicians then and have a dance upon my word that is a happy thought with all our hearts but we must have some additional company so ho champagne picard bourguignon cascaret basque la vendue lorraine provincial la violette i wish the deuce took all these footmen i do not think there is a gentleman in france worse served than i am these rascals are always out of the way almansor tell the servants of my lord marquis to go and fetch the musicians and ask some of the gentlemen and ladies hereabouts to come and people the solitude of our ball exit almansor viscount what do you say of those eyes why marquess what do you think of them yourself i i say that our liberty will have much difficulty to get away from here scot-free at least mine has suffered most violent attacks my heart hangs by a single thread how natural is all he says he gives to things a most agreeable turn he must really spend a tremendous deal of wit to show you that i am in earnest i shall make some extempore verses upon my passion <sighs> seems to think oh i beseech you by all that i hold sacred let us hear something made upon us i should be glad to do so too but the quantity of blood that has been taken from me lately has greatly exhausted my poetic vein deuce take it i always make the first verse well but i find the others more difficult upon my word this is too short a time but i will make you some extempore verses at my leisure which you shall think the finest in the world he is devilish witty he his wit is so gallant and well expressed viscount tell me when did you see the countess last i have not paid her a visit these three weeks do you know that the duke came to see me this morning he would fain have taken me into the country to hunt a stag with him here come my friends scene thirteen look my dears we beg your pardon these gentlemen had a fancy to put life into our heels we sent for you to fill up the void of our assembly we are certainly much obliged to you for doing so this is kind of an extempore ball ladies but one of these days we shall give you one in form have the musicians come yes sir they are here come then my dears take your places dancing by himself and singing la 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 what a very elegant shape he has he looks as if he were a first-rate dancer taking out Madelon to dance my freedom will dance a caranto as well as my feet play in time musicians in time oh what ignorant wretches there is no dancing with them the devil take you all can you not play in time la 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 steady you country scrapers dancing also hold do not play so fast 
I have but just recovered from an illness. Scene 14. With a stick in his hand. Ah, ah, scoundrels, what are you doing here? We have been looking for you these three hours. He beats Masqueril. Oh, oh, oh! You did not tell me that blows should be dealt about? Who is also beaten. Oh, oh, oh! It becomes you well, you rascal, to pretend to be a man of rank. This will teach you to know yourself. Scene 15. What is the meaning of this? It is a wager. What? Allow yourselves to be beaten thus? Good heavens! I did not wish to appear to take any notice of it, because I am naturally very violent, and should have flowed into a passion. <clears throat> to suffer an insult like this in our presence. It is nothing. Let us not leave off. We have known one another for a long time, and among friends one ought not to be so quickly offended for such a trifle. Scene 16. Upon my word, rascals, you shall not laugh at us, I promise you. Come in, you there. Three or four men enter. What means this impudence to come and disturb us in our own house? What? Ladies, shall we allow our footmen to be received better than ourselves? Shall they come to make love to you at our expense, and even give a ball in your honour? Your footman? Yes, our footman. And you must give me leave to say that it is not acting either handsome nor honest to spoil them for us as you do. Oh, heaven! What insolence! But they shall not have the advantage of our clothes to dazzle your eyes. Upon my word, if you are resolved to like them, it shall be for their handsome looks only. Quick, let them be stripped immediately. Farewell, a long farewell to all our fine clothes. The Marquisat and Viscountship are at an end. Ah, ah, you knaves! You have the impudence to become our rivals. I assure you, you must go somewhere else to borrow finery to make yourselves agreeable to your mistresses. It is too much to supplant us, and that with our own clothes. Oh, Fortune, how fickle you are. Quick, pull off everything from them. Make haste, and take away all these clothes. Now, ladies, in the present condition you may continue your amours with them as long as you please. We leave you perfectly free. This gentleman and I declare solemnly that we shall not be in the least degree jealous. Scene 17 what a confusion! I am nearly bursting with vexation. To Masqueril. What is the meaning of this? Who is to pay us? Ask my lord the Viscount. To Jodelet. Who is to give us our money? Ask my lord the Marquis. Scene 18. Ah, you hussies, you have put us in a nice pickle by what I can see. I have heard about your fine goings-on from those two gentlemen who just left. Ah, uh, father, they have played us a cruel trick. Yes, it is a cruel trick, but you may thank your own impertinence for it, you jades. They have revenged themselves for the way you treated them. And yet, unhappy man that I am, I must put up with the affront. Ah, uh, I swear we will be revenged, or I shall die in the attempt. And you rascals! Dare you remain here after your insolence? Do you treat a marquis in this manner? This is the way of the world. The least misfortune causes us to be slighted by those who before caressed us. Come along, brother. Let us go and seek our fortune somewhere else. I perceive they love nothing here but outward show and have no regard for worth unadorned. They both leave. Scene 19. Sir, as they have not paid us, we expect you to do so, for it was in this house we played. Beating them. Yes, yes, I shall satisfy you. This is the coin I will pay you in. As for you, you sluts, I do not know why I should not serve you in the same way. We shall become the common talk and laughing stock of everybody. This is what you have brought upon yourselves by your fooleries. Out of my sight and hide yourselves. You jades, go and hide yourselves forever. Alone. And you that are the cause of their folly, 
You stupid trash. Mischievous amusements for idle minds. You novels, verses, songs, sonnets, and sonatas. The devil take you all. End of The Pretentious Young Ladies by Moliere